Well, it's tea time in London, but wherever you are and whatever you're drinking, um, welcome. I'm Matt Britton. I'm in an office. It's unusual for me, um, and I'm really excited to be here uh, for today's session in I Am Remarkable Week. I Am Remarkable, we know it's our program for uh, over 250,000 people have now been in it, and from 800 organizations in 150 countries with the goals of improving self-promotion skills and motivation, particularly for women and underrepresented groups in the world of work and the world of life, and to challenge the perception around self-promotion. These are 90-minute workshops, and you're invited to consider why you are remarkable and develop skills in that area. And one way I think that's helpful for all of us is to see others, to see their experience, to learn from it, and also to be inspired by it. So today, what do we have? An entrepreneur, an activist, a speaker, a best-selling author of books, including a New York Times best-selling children's book. Uh, somebody who has been a dual major in international relations uh, and African studies. She was on the US fencing team from 2010. And in 2016, at the Rio Olympics, was part of the US um, Sabre team who took the bronze over Italy, sorry Italians, uh, in the U.S., she's also known as the first hijab-wearing woman to represent the U.S. Olympic uh, team, to represent the U.S. at the Olympics. She's a symbol for many, especially entrepreneurs and women and Muslims in the U.S. and beyond. I'm so delighted. So please welcome uh, Ibtihaj Muhammad. Hello. Hello. Good morning. You're a long way away in L.A., yeah? Yeah, morning from Los Angeles. Great to see you, and thanks for joining. Now, look. I described you in lots of different ways there, but given this is I Am Remarkable Week, I, I wonder how do you think about yourself and in what way you think you might be remarkable? Oh, uh, well, I feel like normally I would have so much trouble answering that question, but I feel like it's important for us to lean into um, the things that, you know, we're strong at and really what our purpose is, I guess, in this world. And for me, I've been able to use sport in a way that not only challenges myself, but also challenges society to think about, um, especially someone like me, someone who lives at the intersection of multiple identities in different ways than what you know the societal norm is. I, um, I guess I identify as an entrepreneur, like you said earlier, Matt. I founded a clothing company with my sisters a few years ago, Luella. And that's kind of what I do now, but um, I am an Olympic medalist for Team USA. I won a bronze medal with my team in 2016 at the Olympic Games, and I'm a fencer, which I feel like most people wouldn't um, see someone who looks like me and immediately think like, oh, professional fencer. But, um, you know, I always say that I didn't find fencing, but fencing kind of found me. I grew up playing sports, uh, a lot of different sports, but as a kid who would eventually wear the hijab, which is the scarf that I have on, um, my parents were looking for a sport for me to play that would fit my religious beliefs. I um, only exposed my face and my hands, and in fencing, that's the only thing that you expose, I guess, is your hands. Your body is covered, and it was just this unique opportunity for me to pursue something that I love, which is sport, but also, you know, it kind of naturally adhered to the yeah. tenets of my faith. And like, who knew, you know, a few years yeah. later, I would win an Olympic medal. Well, I'd, well, I'd, I'd like to go back go to back the start of that, and that's got to tell us a few things there about, about how and why. But before I do so, let me just invite our audience, please do, if you have questions that uh, you have now or you'd like to add as you we go through this conversation, if you put them into the YouTube chat window, then we'll be able to take those questions uh, and, and put them to Ibtihaj um, as we go through the conversation. So please do that as we go. But let's pick up on a couple of the things you were saying there, Ibtihaj. So, um, I mean, actually, let's start with family. This family was important to you. And I got a sense from, from reading and researching a little bit about your background that uh, family and sport were really important early on, even before you discovered fencing. And so maybe take us back to that point. Yeah, I'm in the middle of five kids. Uh, and in our family, I don't know, we just grew up kind of, the kids anyway, we grew up outside. I'm millennial and I guess like when I was growing up it was kind of like you went outside and you played outside until the street lights came on and um, I you know would throw around football with my brother or you know we had a pool in our house so we were constantly swimming and just competing with one another so I think that that's kind of where I developed this 
competitive spirit from with which really lended itself to sport mm. but um i don't know family has always been really important to me my mom in particular always told us like you know um you don't need friends you have each other <laughs> so <laughs> that's something that uh you know i kind of always have in the back of my mind to just really keep close ties to not just my siblings, but, you know, my family in general, they're really, really important to me. And they've just been behind me in so many different uh, parts of my life and so many different avenues, whatever thing I want to try next, because I'm just a person who likes, I guess, new challenges. They've always been really supportive of that. Mm. And I got a sense of the rivalry, particularly with your your brother, who's just 18 months older than you, desperately wanting to beat him. I, I'm sure many people who have siblings can identify with, with that a little bit. But that, that, I guess, started to lead you towards getting a bit more serious in sport. And, and maybe tell us a bit more about how you went from trying to beat him in the swimming pool to running and then why fencing and how that happened. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think that anybody who comes from a larger family can attest to the competitive nature that just develops. Um, there's only one boy in our family, my brother, a few months older, like you said. And I don't know, I just always wanted to beat him, even though I generally just never did because he was faster, stronger than me, taller than me. But that didn't, you know, stop me from trying. And um in our household, we had to play sport. Like our parents right. didn't give us a choice. They saw sport as a way for us to not only be active, but have this healthy relationship with our peers. Mm -hmm. So I have really early memories of my parents putting our town recreation book in front of me. I grew up about 30 minutes west of New York City and Maplewood, New Jersey. And so um, I played t-ball, I tried tennis, I ran track for a really long time. But for me, in each of those different sports, like the, my teammates wore singlets in track and field, like little tanks and uh, I don't know, uh, like little shorts. And I always had, you know, to go to the sporting goods store with my mom to buy spandex or to buy a T-shirt underneath my volleyball uniform. Mm -hmm. And um, it was tw I was 12 when we found fencing. I was actually in a car. Uh, my mom and I were at a stoplight in our town and to the right of us was the local high school and there were athletes inside. They were sword fighting. And I remember my mom saying, I have no idea what that is, but when you get to high school, I want you to try it out. And it was really just this opportunity to play a sport where we didn't have to worry about the uniform. Everybody right. wore pants, everybody wore, you know, long jackets. And even though fencing is not super popular in the black community, uh, my yeah. parents wanted me to try it. Well, amazing. Yeah. So it's a coincidence of the uniform of the sport that really drew you to it. Mm -hmm. But then I also have a sense that, you you know, you quite quickly got quite good. So you obviously have some natural athletic talent or drive. What is it you think that kind of got you drawn into fencing, even though you were different from the other people who you were fencing with at the time and it didn't seem like your community was up for participating? What, what drew you into the sport and, and started to get you training, you know, maybe several hours a day, even quite young? Well, I remember at 12 um, looking up uh, collegiate, like different colleges. I knew from a very young age I wanted to go to a top university. Um, but when you come from a large family uh, who working class parents, my mom was a teacher, my dad was a cop, I needed to be creative with how I planned to pay for college. And all the top schools that I planned to apply to, they were all in top 10. And in the country, they all have fencing teams. So for me, it was just kind of this easy, you know, like no brainer. I had to, to join the fencing team. And I remember trying to get my friends at the time to join the team with me. Uh, they were all, you know, also women of color, girls of color. And the first day of fencing tryouts, when we walked in, there were a sea of children, none of which looked like us, none of whom looked like us. And um, I remember them saying, like, there's no way we're fencing, <laughs> like, it's not happening. And um, I could see now, like in hindsight, how just not seeing yourself represented in a space can be a deterrent for kids. And um, for me, I just saw this as a unique opportunity to set myself apart. You know, when I was applying to Duke, you know, Columbia, Harvard, Princeton, I knew that I needed to set myself apart. And mm -hmm. to me, fencing was that ticket. Um, and Matt, earlier you mentioned like just being 
I don't know, athletically gifted or I, I always say that I'm, you know, a girl from Jersey who chose to work hard. When right. I started fencing, I was not the best in the room at all. Uh, I had two left feet. I had no idea what I was doing. I picked, there's three weapons in fencing, foil, epee, and saber. I picked epee because I had a friend who I, a girl I became friends with at tryouts who fenced epee. I think she was Hungarian and her, she, her dad fenced epee. So I was like, oh, I'll fence epee too. Epee is like the, they're the marathoners of fencing. It's very, very slow. Um, I was not great. <laughs> I fenced epee for three years. My high school team needed a saber fencer uh, the, in my junior year. And so I switched because my coach forced me to switch. But a saber is more of like the sprinters. It's very, very fast. Think of slashing. It's just a faster weapon, faster pace. And um, I don't know. I was just so much better at, at saber. I became one of the best athletes in the state. My high school team was arguably the strongest fencing program in the nation. We had well over 100 kids on the team. So it was a very, very large team, very successful team. And so from the start of my fencing career, I was just a part of a successful program that I think really challenged me to get better to support my team, but also supported me even though, you know, ethnically, religiously, I was just different from everyone else. And yeah. it was just such a safe space. But I realized in sport, particularly in fencing, that my religious beliefs, like me, like the simple piece of cloth that I wore had the power to change how people treated me. And that was just something that I realized as a kid uh, through the sport of fencing. So um, let's talk a bit more about being different, if, if we may, um, because I think that's something, you know, you, you, you actually didn't talk too much about the environment you grew up in, but, but you, you were not amongst many people wearing what you're wearing and dealing with the clothing issues you were talking about in sport. And you mentioned uh, walking to the fencing room for the first time and your friends just going, this is not for us. I actually read, by the way, I can highly recommend the book. This is the young, the young adult version, which is about right for me, but an amazing story. If you want to understand more of the story, many of us from around the world, maybe know your story less than those in the U S one of the things that stood out there though, though was this being different. And there was some bullying at school and then there was turning up in fencing and being the only one. So, and then I remember when you got good at fencing, you went to what they call the Junior Olympics, which it's an American phrase for the national championships, as I understand it. It's not the kind of international, but it's a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. And you walk in there and you describe it as being a sea of white. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about that experience of, of being singled out and, and, and what it felt like being different. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I grew up with the same kids from the time I was four or five years old, you know, in kindergarten uh, from the time I was a senior in high school. And even though I had these small instances in my town, a predominantly white town of, you know, being made to feel different, I would say that like generally I felt like mostly comfortable in my town. But through sport, I had the opportunity to travel to, you know, different cities, you know, in my state through my high school team. But then I also started to compete domestically. So like you said, I went to a junior Olympics, which honestly is not a big deal. <laughs> but I did go good. To competition as a kid. And um, I remember just being acknowledged for being different. You know, it's one thing to just kind of be a kid and exist. I'm, you know, think of yourself younger. You're super carefree. You're not thinking about politics. You're not thinking about race. You're not thinking about religion. I feel like these are things that society kind of shapes and molds us to consider as we, you know, get older. And um, for me, when I was young, I just wanted to be the top athlete. I wanted to be the top, you know, person in my class. I have always been really, really competitive and it has nothing to do with anyone else. I just want to, you know, be the best. I don't know where this comes from. Uh, I always say, Matt, that like Olympians are just like a special breed that we're a fine line between, you know, Olympian and crazy. Um, and that's kind of how I was as a kid. I just wanted to be the best, you know, in the room. And again, nothing to do with anyone else. I just want to be good at what I was doing. Um, and I don't know if through sport, it was just, I, I remember very distinctly when 9-11 happened and kind of how it changed the way I was treated. 
and not necessarily from like my peers, but more so from like the adult perspective. So in fencing, there's um, an official who essentially uh, tells you where the point is. So an action can happen, but it's up to the official to tell you where, where the point is. And I just remember that there were very clear actions that you know, for anyone else, you know, the point would be theirs. But for me, it was like a bit difficult, um, especially after 9-11, to just kind of exist in sport. Wow. And I felt like I was fighting tooth and nail and having to score two points just to get one and things like that. And um, All right, so just to, just to pause, because I think that you talked uh, quite a bit there. So you are saying in, in, in fencing match, you kind of you'd make contact or you make the slash that you need to do in Sabre and expect the judge to then award the point to you. Mm-hmm. And you didn't feel it was coming to you. Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's very, very subjective. My mom always says, like, I don't know why you fence. Right. <laughs> She'd rather me play a sport where it's just, like, very yeah. clear. Cross the line first. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Your point. Like, you shoot, you shoot the basketball, it goes through the net, it's your point. She'd rather me play basketball. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's it was definitely difficult. Mm-hmm. But even professionally, I say that um, – I really just kind of like dug my feet down and I said, you know, this is something that I want to do for myself. This is something that I want to do to make sure that people like me, anyone who's ever been told no or that they don't belong, feel represented in these spaces. Because to me, sport has always been and should always be a sport, a place of inclusion and representation. And could you tell us a bit more? I mean, there are people who are maybe younger or people who uh, were not living in the U.S. or we've got people from all over the world uh, watching. Um, Being Muslim post 9-11. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot changed quite quite quickly. Can you sort of t- t- tell us how it changed things for you? As you said, you felt that was happening in fencing, but but what was that world like, and how did you deal with that? Well, it was tough. Again, I was I was relatively young when it happened, and I did. It's it's a lot to try to understand. You know, as a as a young person, you just know that there's this horrific event that happened. You don't even realize the political fallout that that would follow or even the ways that you know you would be socially impacted um but now like in hindsight i see how that 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 event kind of changed um the way we i think as a global community operate in particular you know when it comes to the muslim community you know islamophobia in the uni- in, uni- in the united states was normalized um, mm-hmm. during that time. And I feel like we're, as the, as a Muslim community, we're still trying to dig ourselves out of those really harsh stereotypes that exist about our community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you scroll forward to now, obviously you're recognized um, and have a very high profile as an entrepreneur, but also as a Muslim woman and a successful United States icon. I think, you know, the subtitle of your book is Living My uh, American Dream. So uh, you've gone from sort of almost wanting to be anonymous underneath the fencing outfit to being incredibly visible in that role. How has that felt? Has that been an uncomfortable journey or is this something that you sort of um, landed on your shoulders over time? How has that been? Well, I guess just for a little context, I... Uh, I guess from the way that we've been speaking about sport, it's like I went from high school fencing to the Olympic team, and that is not what happened at all. Many, many hours between the two, I'm sure, yeah. Many hours in between, but I guess the quick story is um, when I was 16, someone told me that there's a a club team in New York City of black fencers, and I remember – being kind of offended for being acknowledged, you know, for, for being different. But at the same time, I was curious. I Googled like black people, New York City fencing. And I found this nonprofit in New York City, the Peter Westbrook Foundation, um, that essentially houses like over 200 kids every Saturday uh, who are learning how to fence. And not just, you know, black fencers, African-American fencers, but people of all different shades and yeah. abilities. Like not everyone is really good, but that was my first time seeing Olympians, world champions, people who had won NCAAs. And um, that's the first time I think unconsciously grafted my aspiration in sport beyond fencing in college. So when I graduated from college, um, I graduated in the middle of the recession in 2007. 
And um, I was fencing, I got back into fencing and I noticed that there had never been a woman of color on the US women's saber team, the national team. And um, I don't know, I just kind of, I don't know how to this day, how I convinced my parents to help me fund the stream of qualifying for a national team. Matt, you know how difficult that is. It's, it's yeah. hard, financially difficult. It's a lot of time, a lot of energy. But um, I was working odd jobs. I worked as like a cashier in a store. I was officiating fencing, local fencing competitions. I was coaching a local high school team all to fund this dream of qualifying for a national team. And then when I qualified for my first team in 2010, um, it was just kind of like a roller coaster I never got off of. I never imagined in a million years, you know, back in 2008 when I was working hard to qualify for my first team, I was also, also studying for the LSAT and, you know, preparing to go to law school. I didn't know that my life was going to take this sharp turn and, to professional sport. I always like it's it's so interesting how life can be really cyclical yeah. where I feel like fencing found me as a kid and then yeah. it also just kind of I don't know really dictated I guess where my life has has taken me. Yeah. And so you're right we sort of jumped between getting started in the Olympics. So let's fill in a bit more of that that detail because I think you there are a couple of key turning points there, right? So you talked about the, you know, the moment when you drive past the school and people are wearing outfits, your mom goes, this looks interesting. You talked about a bit sort of being, being hauled out of Epe into Sabre and a more aggressive thing, that finds a moment. And then I know you've kind of, you'd, you'd taken a pause from fencing for a while. You'd been traveling and you go back to the Peter West, Westerbrook um, gym and you walk into a room full of a huge number of fencers of all different races, as you say, including kind of, national and international champions that seems like a moment of somehow that reignited your desire because you to all intents and purposes have given off your opt to be off to be a lawyer so that's a pretty pivotal life moment is it where you decide actually i'm not going to go and do the law firm thing i'm actually going to see if i can you know achieve something in fencing D did it happen like that was it a gradual process did you get drawn in by that that team that that uh, center how did it happen yeah, so I'd taken a year off from fencing. I didn't fence my senior year at Duke. And um, I, I think that it was really just the environment of fencing that I missed. I loved my high school fencing team. I yeah. loved the Peter, my time at the Peter Westbrook Foundation. And to graduate from university and then kind of be back in that space, even if it was just, you know, to kind of stay in shape, yeah. I think I, I really missed it. Yeah. And um, I had at that time a coach who was super misogynistic, honestly, for all like, I don't know, he just never believed in me. And I kind of thrive off of people not um, just, you know, not expecting much from me. I feel like I love a challenge. And the idea that I could be an underdog and, and people just, you know, don't think of me as a contender, I think that that really just kind of reignited this fire and drive that I always knew that I had. I, I know, and I've always known that I, I am the hardest working person in the room, even though I lacked the experience at, when I graduated. I'd never been to an international competition. I never competed on the senior level. I had no domestic ranking, I think, in the world and my first world cup it was actually in the uk matt um i was ranked 250th at my first world cup and so i made a very drastic turn by changing coaches and really learning to fence and compete tactically which i'd never been taught before mm -hmm. i'd always been a very like um responsive athlete like i was using my speed my strength to kind of beat my opponents, but imagine having all of the tools, you know, like fencing is a game of physical chess. And yeah. so, yeah, you can be fast, you could be strong, but the, the key thing about fencing is like the mental game. You want to tactically be better than your opponent. And when I learned to fence tactically, I just honestly saw a really big change in, in my, in my career. It, helped me qualify for my first national team. And then also 
you know, move up the world rankings to one of the top fencers in the world. And so yeah, that sounds like you're moving from sort of fully instinctive. You're using using all your physical attributes, but you're doing it instinctive in the moment to there's a playbook here where this happens, I do this and where this happens, I do that. And you, you suddenly have a new vocabulary, almost a new a new side to your fencing. Mm -hmm. That sounds kind of mentally uh, challenging as well as phys physically challenging. I mean, who knew that there was anything outside of just instinctive fencing? I had no idea, but honestly, that's that's just levels, right? Yeah. I had never been like classically trained in like this, this yeah. technical side of the sport. I had no idea. And this is, you know, in my 20s that, and again, I, this is why I feel like I was such an outsider coming into this national mm -hmm. and onto the, the world, the world cup circuit, because it's just kind of unexpected. A lot of most of my teammates, especially on the Olympic team, they've all been, to cadet world championships, junior world championships. They've been on yeah. the United States team in some capacity from the time they were children. And for me, yeah. you know, my first real go at this, you know, was in my twenties. So it's yeah. definitely an unconventional, you know, journey in the way that I've I've taken this route that I've taken. But I always say that, you know, your journey is unique and specific to you. And it's not for other people to understand. I feel like yeah. it's for you to kind of figure out and to really lean into and just kind of find your own footing and, you know, go at your own pace. Yeah, well, it's pretty remarkable what you did, aside from the kind of background you came from, just that unconventional route. Um, that's kind of remarkable as well, isn't it? To kind of be out of the sport, be kind of drawn back into it, just from a sense of kind of the club and the community, and then actually to get, get that level of aspiration and coming out onto the world stage kind of almost unranked. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's up, up against you, I mean, take to, to a, one of your fights on the, road to Rio, you know, kind of showing up and people don't really know what to expect. Is that an advantage to you? It's almost like you deliberately took that positioning. Well, I mean, that's like super early on. I mean, yeah. I won a lot of medals on the World Cup circuit and, you know, competed on Team USA for 10 years. We yeah. have five medals at World Championships, one World Championships in 2014, um, and won an Olympic medal. Like, there was by, by no means were was my team were we outsiders at the Olympic Games. Yeah, no, I was I was sort of sorry. I was back in the journey really from from uh, you went from kind of relatively anonymous to kind of pretty successful pretty quickly. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it, there, I guess that's um, um, in some respects that's that's true, especially early on. But I feel like I started to make my name a name yeah. for myself after I you know qualified for my my first team and. Yeah. You, the officials, the other athletes, people get a sense of like, you know, who the up and coming athletes are, yeah. who, who to look out for. And um, I would say that it was really helpful in my career for me to start to believe in myself and start to believe in my trajectory and, mm -hmm. and wanting to see, you know, where and like how good I could become in the sport. And was there a moment if you where you where you sort of felt, OK, I'm now a world class athlete or. Mm -hmm. Is that too an immod immodest feeling? Because you, you get to the point, don't you, where you're competing on the world stage and you're sort of feeling like, yeah, I can I can win medals at this level. Was there a moment where that was established or did that sort of in re only come in retrospect? Um, You know, in our sport, we have two days of competition. Uh, the first day of competition, the top 16 in the world don't compete. And I remember that moment. Um, you know, I think we were competing in France and I was looking at the, the tableau for the next day and I'm looking and I see that like I'm, you know, 16th and I'm like, wait a second, I don't have to fence in this pre preliminary day of, of fencing. Like that was kind of strange because I, you know, I'm a workhorse. I'm here to like, you know, dig my feet in and secure my spot for the next day. But being top 16, it's kind of like, wait okay. a second. I've arrived. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've arrived. And that I think was a cool moment for like young Iptihaj. But um, I would say that I, I remember uh, winning world championships with my team in 2014. Mentally, that was difficult for me because um, I felt pressure to kind of show up as a world champion all the time. Yeah. And yeah. I, I started to mentally kind of put myself in this, in this hole that I had a hard time getting out of. And yeah. And Matt, you know this just from reading my book, Proud, but I started to suffer from 
performance anxiety where it, I mean, it was just this outer body experience where I physically could not lift my arms or my legs. I had trouble breathing and it would only happen, you know, the day of a competition, even though I've slept really well, i have like well rested, I've eaten, I've mm. training really hard. Why am I, you know, underperforming? What is this, this sensation that is, you know, overwhelming my body before I compete? And just in seeking help and working with a, with a sports psychologist, I was able to um, kind of pinpoint and highlight what I was feeling and what those symptoms were and really mm -hmm. understanding how to kind of take control of my anxiety mm -hmm. and nerves and understand that like I have these medals from world championships and as a result of the hard work, right? As a result of, all of those hours in the gym, all of the, that time away from your friends, away from your family um, to develop your craft. And that's something that I feel like I had to accept, right? Yeah. That I'd become one of the best athletes in the world. And um, I had to believe in myself, right? Yeah. And not trick myself into, you know, losing my matches. And I call them in my book, Muhammad Ali mantras, which is, really just a nod to my favorite athlete of all time, Muhammad Ali. And I always say that I don't think he was cocky. I think that he had this amazing sense of just awareness and he was able to build himself up by telling himself he was the greatest, he was the best. And I think that that was just a way to combat the nervousness and the anxiousness that we all as humans feel at some point in our lives. Yeah. But I think that he knew how hard he worked and how much he prepared. So yeah. why not tell yourself that you're able and you're capable? And yeah, so not, I, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I took those parts of Muhammad Ali's life, my favorite athlete, and I just applied them to my career. I started to, before I competed, tell myself how amazing I was. Mm -hmm. And this is all in my head. I had yeah. these huge headphones um, that never played music. I just was honestly talking to myself and, really hyping myself up and trying to visualize longer lunges, faster lunges, yeah. just better than my opponents. And I feel like that was a way that I was able to kind of excel my career. Yeah. So I think, you know, many people who compete different levels in different sports will sort of be familiar with that notion of trusting the process. But I think more and more, and you, you're one of the pioneers in this, more and more we hear athletes talking about their mental health challenges, performance anxiety actually being a thing, which is incredibly helpful actually to everyone to understand that, even you know olympic medalists have these have these uh, concerns and anxieties and how do they deal with it it's extremely helpful for, for people so thank you for sharing that I, I do want to come come to rio now so you know you're you're on the world stage at rio expectations are high just tell us a bit about the the, the journey there and and what happened in the the medal stakes for you yeah um rio was amazing i remember when i qualified for the olympic team i qualified in february of 2016, so well before a lot of other athletes for yeah. Team USA. I remember I found out through a, a news article, like a Google alert, actually. They I, didn't call you? They didn't call you and tell you the news? That that gives you an idea of the state of the, the U.S. fencing organization. Right. No one told me I qualified. <laughs> I wow. actually was on my computer checking emails, uh, scheduling a massage appointment with my therapist, and I got a Google alert. That said, you know, Ibtihaj Muhammad becomes first woman to qualify for a U.S. Olympic team in hijab, something like that. And I remember running downstairs and just like screaming at my parents that we were going to the Olympics. Um, a, like a surreal moment. And I, I still to this day, I feel like it's a pinch me moment in my life because I never talked about the Olympics. I never right. even said the word because for me, it was a dream that was so big. And so fragile that if I spoke it, you know, it would disappear. So um, it just wasn't something that that I talked about because I wanted it so bad that I was afraid that it wouldn't happen almost. Mm. And um, when I qualified, I qualified at the height of the 2016 presidential election in the United States. A lot of the candidates were kind of using the Muslim community as scapegoats to just really, I think, create a very dis uh, divisive America. And um, 
I felt like this was my, this was my chance. This was my shot. And I, I know that I was different from other athletes and that they had the opportunity to just solely focus on sport. For me, all of my questions from media at the Olympic games were around politics. Yeah. And, um, I felt like this was my opportunity to change how people saw, you know, Muslim women. And it was one that was not, you know, dark and one built on this idea of oppression. It was more about me being, you know, American by birth and not having a connection to any other nation, only speaking English and being confident in who I, in who I am um, and really challenging this dark narrative and these dark stereotypes that have been built out about our community mm-hmm. and just showing a different lens, a different side of our community, one that represents, you know, the United States at the highest level of sport. But also I wanted, as much as I wanted it to be a window to the Muslim community, I also wanted to be a lens. You know, I wanted yeah. other Muslims to see, you know, the yeah. things that, you know, we could be capable of. But again, the most surreal moment of my life was qualifying. I feel like winning an Olympic medal was just as much of a shock for me as it was for anybody who was watching. <laughs> just before, let's pause for the moment for the medal, because I just want to unpick again something you said there. So on the one hand, you were saying you were almost superstitious about voicing an aspiration to go to the Olympics until it happened because it was such a big thing. On the other, you go to the Olympics and you're assuming this additional burden, which for many competitors would be feel like an enormous kind of distraction and weight they don't need when they all already have all the pressure, the pressure you've described it, that you're under when you, you have a prospect of, of a medal. But you, you sounded like you happily kind of assumed that because you saw that you had this responsibility and this opportunity. Um, you know, it, I've been answering questions about who I am my whole life. Right. And when, you know, we talked about this earlier, I was bullied as a kid. And if I wasn't being bullied for hijab, if I wasn't being bullied for being the black kid in the classroom or, you know, wanting to have straight A's, it was always going to be something. That's how I felt as a kid. Like, they're not going to like you no matter what. So why not just like love yourself, right? Why not just kind of show up unapologetically and like, this is who I am. Like, you actually don't have to like it, but you Interesting. have to accept it. So you were ready. You were ready for that. Yeah, I feel like it was just something that I developed as a kid from being kind of, you know, picked on. And so when it came to the Olympics and having to answer to me sometimes silly questions, it was like, well, if I have to break this down, I will, because it's not about me. The journey is bigger than me. The journey is about reshaping a narrative for, you know, millions of people around the globe and hopefully helping all of us challenge the implicit biases that we carry about the Muslim community, about the black community, about women, about the things that, you know, they're able to do. And I don't know, just kind of reshape the way in which we consider, you know, um, these different underserved, underrepresented communities. Wonderful. Thank you. And now I've held you back from talking about the medal winning and how things changed as a result of that. So take us there. Um, the metal, I don't know. It's like rainbow birthday cake. It's like, it's just amazing. (laughs) Honestly, I I can't just to even think about that moment brings me so much happiness because my family was there. Uh, I had 10 members of my family there, like all of my siblings, their spouses, my nephew, my parents, uh, my, one of my best friends came. It was my first time, you know, for some of my family to even see me compete internationally. It's my first time my dad seeing me compete internationally, my brother, my nephew, like my nephew still to this day, he just started seventh grade. He still lists me like as his sport hero. Like he wants to go to Duke and play basketball, which is like a dream of mine for like all of my nieces and nephews to go to Duke as well. Um, but I don't know. It's just, it was a really fulfilling moment for me because, um, I know how difficult and how challenging my career and journey was as an athlete. I faced a lot of adversity, um, not just from, you know, like opponents, but a lot of times from teammates on Team USA. Mm. And that it's challenging because 
you know, for most people, they would walk away. A lot of people wouldn't have stayed through what I, what I, what I, what I went through. They would have, you know, I think chosen almost themselves and been like, you know, it's not worth the headache. Mm. But for me, I think I saw the bigger picture and, and I saw that I wanted to create a space that was inclusive. And the only way I knew to do that was to, you know, continue to fight, to continue to qualify. Mm. Um, I didn't know that the end of the journey was winning an Olympic medal. I feel like that was just a gift from God and I feel really appreciative. But um, if anyone, I think, takes anything away from my story, it's that, you know, the impossible is always possible. I've been told my whole life that, you know, I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not fast enough. Um, and I've always believed that I have all the things, that mm. I have all the things to be successful. And I feel like I owe that to maybe great parenting. I feel like my parents always pushed us, um, mm. challenged us. Like an A minus was never good enough. Um, mm. You know, winning a bronze medal, never good enough. My parents want more. But um, I think of it, you know, almost like tough love in that just reminding you that there's always more that you can do. There's more um, there's more that you can do for yourself, but more importantly, more you can do for the community and more work that we can all do to kind of change and shape the world in which, you know, we want to live yeah. in. Remarkable. And um, you then are listed in the uh, Time magazine top 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, they make a Shiro Barbie of you. You are the face of the first sports hijab from Nike and you're in demand uh, in TV studios and media. And you, you have a sort of profile as almost as an icon for the, for the nation and for Muslim women. Is that something that sat easy on your shoulders? Did you have to make an adjustment to that? T tell us a bit about the sort of post-Olympic profile that you've had and, and what you've felt about that and how you've tried to use it? Well, Matt, I don't know if I've ever considered myself an icon. That kind of gave me goosebumps a little bit. I think there's um, a clue when you're on the top 100 list. That's a pretty good clue, isn't it? Come on. I don't know. I'm, I'm honestly like a very chill person. I am literally just here to create change. I think that I've always thrived in trying to do things that I think empower, you know, myself in a sense, but also other people. And I really believe that we all have everything we need already inside to be successful. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, finding those resources, finding those things that are going to help us get to that next point. And I don't want anyone here to think that like, you know, getting to the Olympics was like the, the dream, you know, when I was 12 and I started in this sport, I always set really small goals for myself right. throughout, my, throughout my career. And yeah. even now, you know, I think that it's really about small goal setting that will help you, you know, achieve that big goal, that big pot of gold at the end, you know, of the yeah. rainbow. It's about really just understanding that you will create, have mistakes, you will have falls, yeah. but, if sport has taught me anything, it's that you learn from losing and that that's yeah. not, that will not define you. I mean, we did not talk about this map, but I did not qualify for my first Olympic team in 2012. And I saw other athletes who were so broken by that. I promise you, they still have not gotten over it. Oh, yeah. Me, yeah. I didn't qualify in 2012 and I just kind of kept going, right? I didn't let that moment define me. And I say that, to say that, you know, a fall or loss does not have to break you. It doesn't have to deter you yeah. from, you know, that big goal. And I don't know, there, there's so much that we're capable of. We just have to become our own cheerleaders and believe in it. Yeah, I think there's a quote, is it I win or I learn, which I always really like, uh, particularly when I get beaten. Um, so <laughs> uh, Let's talk for a moment. I want to take some questions from the audience, but I do, I do want to just touch on Luella, which I think is named for your grandmother. Is that right? Your, your. Um, let me get this right. It's dangerous for me to venture into women's fashion, but sort of affordable and modest fashions uh, for women. Is that a fair positioning? Yes. Okay. Luella, but, named after my dad's mom. Yeah. Uh, it's really was an opportunity to create affordable, modest fashion. So keyword fashion. I feel like everything on our website's very cute. We keep everything affordable because I, 
believe that fashion should be accessible to everyone. Fantastic. Yeah. And how's that going? You're, now you're an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, running a fashion business. Yeah. Um, but also, Matt, I think the biggest thing for me was that I wanted to make conscious clothing. So I wanted to reduce my um, environmental footprint. We only manufacture here in the United States. So from Los Angeles and New York, and we, you know, are creating jobs in our communities. Like we only work with female manufacturers who employ other women. And I feel like it's just a great way to give back um, as not only to our consumer, but also to the people who make our clothes. Fantastic. Well, best of luck with that. Let's let's take a couple of questions from uh, the audience. Um, we've got time to do that if we can have a look and see. So Najib uh, asks, I wanted to ask, with the recent issues of Norwegian women's beach handball team were fined because their shorts were too long. What can Olympians like you to bring more awareness to this issue? Yeah, for the people who didn't see that, there were two side by side images, I think, of the women wearing the shorts they would like to wear and then the, the standard shorts that the uh, I think the Federation requires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I reposted that article, uh, and I, I think that there was like some American artist that covered the the fines for the Norwegian team. I thought it was really commendable that they're challenging this norm that's been created uh, in beach volleyball of like what women, you know, uh, or what the the length, I guess, of the, the shorts yeah. or bikini bottoms are. And it's the same thing. I think it was the German women's gymnastics team, you know, that wore the full, the full body suit when competing. And it was really interesting to me how generally the comments were really positive and it's kind of this reclaiming of, of women's bodies and women having, you know, the right to share and disclose what they want of their bodies and also to be comfortable when competing. Um, and I always like to think about how that is so sh it sharply contrasts the way that society is when it comes to hijab. Yeah. Um, the sport has such a profile, doesn't it, that it does set expectations and aspirations in positive ways, such as your journey and, and, and you know, the role that you now play inspiring other people. Uh, the London Olympics that you missed, the whole slogan was inspire a generation, the inspirational power of sport. So when sports making choices like that, it also has a negative uh, impact, I guess. Should we take another question? Uh, so here's Anna. Anna, for those who don't know, is the founder of I Am Remarkable, um, this program which has reached so many people and, and this week is all about it. So, Anna, hi, and thank you for the program. How was it to adjust to life after sports and the Olympics? And how did you how did you go about that reinvention? That's a great question. I should have asked it because Anna has got better questions than me. No surprise there. That's a great question. I don't know if Anna I had to reinvent myself. If anything, I think that sport has given me such a great platform to do things that I'm really passionate about. Um, I knew that I wanted to, uh, you know, pen my memoir when I finished competing. Um, I also knew that I wanted to delve into the children's literary space. And I was really fortunate to sign a three book, a three part book deal. And my first children's book, The Proudest Blue has done so well. And yeah, I, yeah my next book is due to come out next fall. So it's just been, an opportunity to kind of use that momentum from the Olympic games. And yeah. I, I don't know, I feel like I've transcended sport in a way that has really helped my career. And I feel like there's more left in the tank. What it is yet, I don't know, but I feel like there's more coming. I love the metaphor you're saying, you know, you, you sort of got the momentum and that's kind of carried you forward a little bit, which is, which is great. So maybe you're back in that mode you were when you first started fencing of being sort of, in the flow and instinctive about what you're doing. Yeah, I, I don't feel like it, you know, has to be fencing. There's so many different things that, you know, I enjoy doing, especially when it comes to just being an entrepreneur um, and, you know, writing these books. It's been such a great way to help make sure that different communities, especially those that I'm a part of, feel represented not only in the fashion space, but in the children's literary space as well. Great, thank you. Let's take one more question. Mariana, we talk a lot about imposter syndrome, and I was wondering if you've ever suffered from it, and what you did, what did you do to get out of that place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that's that's a tough one. I do feel like um, 
that happens a lot in sport for sure. And what I think helped me get out of that mindset is, and Matt, you know this, it's all the hours that you put into what you are doing, right? Like you developing that craft, it does not happen overnight. You spend so much time and energy and that's like minus all the the time that you know what you're doing your passions they live rent free you know in your mind so when i wasn't at physically training or you know watching what i was eating or making sure i was getting the amount of re- right amount of rest or watching videos or taking notes on myself or my opponents i'm thinking about the sport so i feel like it was a 24/7 you know, job. And so if ever there were a moment where someone made me feel like I didn't belong, or maybe that idea even trickled in my mind that I shouldn't be here. It's like, oh, no, no, no. I put in all the time, like I have the time card to show that I was the first person in the gym and the last person to leave. So I belong here. And I feel like it's so important for you to understand that you've put in the time and the energy and the effort to be there. So you have to like kind of lean into um, you're you're deserving of being and achieving the things that you have. Yeah. You put me in mind of a phrase that's a favorite of one of my friends who's also an Olympic medalist. uh, uh, Not that I have that many, um, uh, which is that uh, performance equals potential minus interference. And so that's what you're talking about there is the kind of interference. How do you keep the interference down as much as possible? So, you know, you're saying your mode of that is to go back to the process and the time you've put in and the people you've fought and and everything else, which is incredibly useful. How do you think that translates outside of sport? How do you think you translate that into your day-to-day life? Because I'm sure there are setbacks as an entrepreneur all the time, you know, supply chains goes down. There's the occasional pandemic that gets in the way of your business plan. So how, how do you apply that in, in, in the, the field outside of sports? I, I highly recommend any parents on this call, put your kids in sport. Um, that's like, I have to preface this with that because sport teaches you so much, not just about like life, like life lessons, but also so much about yourself. Um, perseverance is such a big part of sport, right? Because we all know what loss looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're able to kind of pick up the pieces you're able to dissect you know your your weaknesses in order to build on those weaknesses and kind of turn them into strengths and like you know be better do better your next competition at the next world cup whatever it is and i think that that has really that persistence and resilience that i've learned through sport has has translated so well into other things I'm very type A person and that um, I like to do a lot of things myself. I want them to be, you know, like really, really well done. And um, I feel like it's helped me for sure as an entrepreneur. I mean, I've, I don't have an MBA. I have no background in fashion. So there's a really sharp learning curve here uh, for me and my sisters, but it's been so much fun, you know, to just kind of, use a different part of my brain and be really creative. And also I think with everything that I do, I want there, you know, I want to be intentional about it, but I want there to be purpose. And I feel like with fashion, it's just been such a fulfilling thing to fill a void in the U S market for, you know, like modest clothes and hopefully make it easier for people who want to, you know, who choose to dress modestly. I know when I was a kid, it was really difficult. I spent a lot of time like layering and really awkward and hopefully, you know, like young girls out there don't have that problem anymore because Luella, you know, solves that. There's something there. I wonder if it's fair to say there's something about clarity of vision. So I do think sometimes in sports, you know, the super clear vision, like I want to win the Olympic gold medal. I've got to train for your four years really, really hard. I do it perfectly. That's a very clear vision. Sometimes in life and in business, the vision's a bit less clear, but I think with this with Luella, you've got a super clear purpose. And I do think many businesses are finding this, particularly in this kind of time of uncertainty, having clarity of purpose seems to really help. Sounds like you have that in your business, even if you're going on the learning journey. Yeah, you know, you brought up a great point. The pandemic, I mean, what a curveball. It's so difficult. I can't, I know how difficult it's been for our small business. Like our manufacturers on 
our manufacturers that we had here in Los Angeles all closed down um, and did not reopen. So you have to pivot really quickly. Um, and yeah, I feel like when it comes to anything that you're doing during the pandemic is just kind of give yourself grace because we're all just trying to survive. Give yourself grace. Yeah. Let's take one final question from the audience. We're getting towards the top of the hour. So just the last couple uh, of moments. So Julia is asking, thank you, Ittihaj, to take time to talk to us. Thank you. What was the hardest moment of your career? How did you overcome it? Whoa, uh, Juliana, great question. Uh, in fencing, the Olympic qualification is one whole year. And I remember before the qualification started, I was speaking with my mentor, his name is Peter Westbrook. And I remember saying to him, like, what happens if, you know, they don't select me for the team? And he just reminded me in that moment that, you know, I'm a God-fearing person, so is, is Peter. And he reminded me that, you know, I have to have faith in, like, God's plan. And that it's not going to be a person who selects me for the team. Like, whatever is meant to be is, like, going to happen. And I have to be mindful of that. And so in that year of competitions, I feel like I really just tried to enjoy myself. I had some really crazy moments. I tore a ligament in my foot. I was training at um, the Olympic Training Center in Paris, and I literally, like, fell, tore a ligament in my foot, had to compete at a Grand Prix on it the next day, won a bronze medal, don't know how. That was just, like, a lot of training. Um a lot of adrenaline because my foot, like, yeah. I don't, I still don't know how I made it through that day. I had a, a bout of food poisoning at a, a at a lounge in, in Warsaw and had to compete in Athens the next day. <laughs> like, it was crazy. I don't know how I did it, but a lot of, again, training and perseverance. And I feel like, those were my most difficult moments during the Olympic qualification process is injury, oh. illness, and still managing to, you know, win yeah. medals and persevere. And like, to, again, still can't believe it happened. Still can't believe I was able to do it. But I think those were the most difficult moments. And that's where the training comes in. You know, you're able to kind of lean on those things that, you know, prepared you for those difficult moments. Yeah. And, you know, if there's so many things I'd love to have gone into in more detail and so many great questions still to ask you. Uh, I wonder whether Ramadan, for example, and your faith has played a role. So, you know, fasting and training, maybe that helps you get over the food poisoning. Who knows? So much more. We, we're, we're kind of pretty much out of time. So I, I, can I just ask you one final thing? And we to, so much we can take away from what you've said in our own ways. Um, you've You've given us some fairly direct advice in a couple of areas. Final question, really. Advice for those who feel they don't fit, but also mm -hmm. any advice for those of us who often are the ones who, who do fit, but are trying to be helpful to those who don't. So what would you say to both groups? Um, you know, I've spent my entire life being told that I don't fit, but I am really great at ignoring what people have to say <laughs> and just kind of doing my own thing. Yep. Um, and I think that it is so refreshing when you are able to really appreciate yourself and show up unapologetically. Sometimes that unapologetic like attitude is just how hard you know you're willing to work, how you know you are not going to apologize for the things about you that you know are your strengths. And when it comes to those who you know sit in positions of power, have a seat at the table, no matter what company you work for, no matter what spaces you're in, whether these are friend groups, professional groups, social groups, professional groups, I would just encourage everyone to make sure that they're, that the room is always diverse. And I think that that's the best way and the fastest way that we'll move towards a more equitable world. And that, um, we're always making sure that everyone has, you know, the chance to to have their voice heard, to have, you know, their ideas shared. And um, that will help those who feel like they're not given the opportunities is to, for all of us to make sure that when we play a part in kind of creating those diverse spaces, we choose to do so. 
Thank you. Make room for everyone. So can I just say an enormous thank you? It's been a real pleasure, personally, I know for our audience as well, to, to hear from you. I think we can see not just from the list of achievements and medals and uh, the story, but actually from, from a bit more of an insight into the person, just, just why you are remarkable. So Ifti House Mohammed, many, many thanks from all of us to you. Thank you so much for having me. This is so much fun. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.